So with that, I'm really happy to start the presentations. Each of these is, uh, presenters is an expert. Uh, they're going to cover different aspects of how not just to, to work and learn and live online, but how to do it effectively. So I'm very pleased to introduce the first speaker, a, a personal friend of mine, as well as a colleague at Dell Technologies, Jim Ganthier, the Senior Vice President for Customer Solutions Strategy and Advocacy. Jim. Thank you very much, Jay. And, and thanks to the Austin Forum for the opportunity to have this uh, conversation tonight. What I'm going to do is twofold. I'm going to basically give you a view of what we see happening around the world. And when I say a view of what we see, we have the pleasure and honor of covering everything from small and medium business all the way up to some of our largest enterprises. So as we've all come through this uh, you know, unique scenario in all of our lives over the last couple of months, what I wanted to do was do a couple of things. One, share with you some of our, our learnings. Two, share with you some of our best practices. Three, have a conversation on what we see in terms of both ascendancy and descendancies. What are the things that are become more and more of our everyday lives? And then equally as important, some of the things that are going to become less and less. Um, so we'll start with the first conversation, which is, look, all of us are entering into this global new normal. And when I say global new normal, let's not fool ourselves. This has fundamentally changed the way that we all work, live and play. And so if I think about all of the conversations we've had with customers, with partners, and also with analysts and, and other um, smart folks in our industry, I'd say it boils down to a couple of things. One, for the first time, millions of people worldwide are having to learn to work from either home or a remote location. And honestly, for a whole bunch of them, it's the very first time they've had to do it. It's not just the first time they've had to do it, it's the first time that our IT systems have had to do it. It's the first time that all of the interlinked systems that bring these things to bear have had to do it. And so in essence, it's really about empowering, it's about creating, it's about providing and protecting. So if I wanna double click on each of these, look, we've all seen this because we're kind of doing it tonight, right? How do we make sure that productivity is anywhere? A lot of the customer conversations that we traditionally have had have been about making the individuals productive. The conversations we're now starting to see and have is how do I make the organization more productive? How do I make my entire company more productive? And the rise of productivity metrics is a big thing that we're seeing. So that's a basic item. The second piece is, is that you know a lot of us are used to in-office experiences. And again, this is a global view. There are some cultures around the world where a handshake is the only way you can do business. Probably not so much today, unless you want to do a very quick elbow bump. There are other places where in-office experiences where you've got to sign things, you've got to actually review items. How do we go about creating those particular scenarios without having to have the in-person contacts? So we're having a lot of those discussions. The most important piece is, look, the back-end systems, whether you're an SMB or you're an actual enterprise. So if you're an SMB, who's your online service provider? If you are a true enterprise, how do you give people the capabilities? How do you give them the right access? To use a phrase from a, uh, a good personal friend of mine who happens to be the CIO of one of the largest research universities in the US, look, I'm used to having maybe 15, 20,000 students at a given time on our systems. In two days, I had to accommodate 50,000 kids. And I had to make sure that the data that they've got is not just data that typically is protected behind a firewall, but how do I ensure that the data on their laptops are allowing them to do what they need to do? And then last but not least is cyber threats. Um, Jay knows this story really well. I happen to have the honor of being an executive sponsor for a 600 year old university in Europe. And you know, one of the things that they're quickly finding out is in times like these, the best and the good starts to rise. Also bad actors start to rise. So this particular university was being targeted by folks who said, look, you know, if you want to access your classes, please go here and use your login as usual. That login went to a scraper. You can imagine all the fun things that happened. So as we think about this global new normal, if we think about what are the things that we all have to take a look at, it's really about the different layers of complexity. We're going to have to accommodate different workforces and needs. We're going to have to make sure that it's accessible to everyone and everyone from disability or differently enabled all the way up to folks who may or may not have access, which you'll hear from some of my peers who are going to cover these pieces. How do we make sure we have the tools for all the levels? 
How do we make sure that we have the right flexibility? You'll hear words like spike capacity. You'll hear words like extra capability. And then last but not least, honestly, this is a cultural change. And you know, if you think about the folks who are most at risk, all of us have grown up on technology. To some extent, you could argue some of our you know, younger siblings and or children, this has been normal for them. But try explaining that to a 76 year old who is sitting in a nursing home. How do we make that technology accessible? How do we help them with the cultural pieces? And then last but not least is the overarching budget piece. So just to give you a feel and to set the table for the rest of the presenters tonight, that's kind of what we're seeing at the new global normal. So Jay, if you go to the next one, please. Here's the next thing, is that once you've taken a look at these are the things that you need to be careful of, there are some best practices. And again, whether you're an SMB, you should be asking these of your online solution provider or your actual solutions provider, or if you're a large enterprise and you wake up like we do, making sure that you know, some of the largest companies in the world are doing well. Some representative best practices, because this is a short list, are, look, before this, a lot of what we had to go do was to make sure that the right VPN architectures that enable the very tools we're using tonight, whether it's Zoom, Microsoft Teams, um, not that I'm particular to any of them, could be uh, WebEx, could be Skype, all of those things had to have a backend modern VPN architecture. We're also starting to hear and get a lot of requests on integrated solutions. People needed to be up and running fast. This was something that a lot of folks hadn't really counted on. So how do you ensure that you're not only provisioning folks very quickly, but for the folks that have to provide that, everything needed to be more software defined. Everything needs to be more automated. So what we're starting to hear and see now is because of that, now from a security perspective, from a network perspective, from a life cycle support perspective, and when I say life cycle, it's great to get somebody up and running, but how do you make sure that the systems stay high performance? How do you make sure that when something goes south, because most of us are in the tech industry, it will, it's just a matter of time, that they really are back up and running faster. And the reason why that's important is, remember, a lot of these folks, their, their uh, infrastructure is their website. It is their lifeblood for their businesses. So how do we make sure that services and support are there? And then an interesting item that we're starting to see because we had to roll up our shirt sleeves and help some of our downstream providers is, look, a lot of folks had done outsourcing. A lot of folks have moved to XSIs. They could be Indian systems integrators, global systems integrators, defense systems integrators. We're starting to hear a lot of them now are saying, you know what, maybe I took too much outside and I need to have that in-house knowledge so I can have both the IT flexibility and the agility required in order to go execute. And then as we look forward into the future, Jay, if you go to the next one, please. More and more of our team members are asking us for not just basic services, they want to have everything as a service. They want to be up and running quickly. They want to make sure they have access to the right resources. They want to feel as if they're in the office and do that in a self-automated way. Having to go do a mother may I please to different folks within the IT procurement or the IT instantiation space, that's not going to be something that we either want or tolerate in the future. And then equally as important, we got to make sure that as we build these systems out, what are these continual integrated technology things that as we go through the improvement cycle, how do we get more automation? How do we get more robotics? Not for the sake of automation and robotics, but for the sake of speed, for the sake of, for the sake of ease of doing business, and frankly, to keep business up and moving. And so the net is, is that if we think about some of the things that in these best practices that have changed forever, Jay, if you go to the next one, please. Look, I think most of us are starting to see the old adage of, I've got to, oh, sorry, Jay, one too many. The old adage of, I need to be in the office every day is kind of going away. A lot of us are starting to think, and you know, I was joking with a few of the uh, presenters tonight, look, if I can spend two less hours on the front of a trip or on the back end of a trip, and if I can now do more video executive briefings, or in some cases, video conversations, I'm all in. The perception of productivity, as I mentioned before, it used to be about individual productivity. Now it's about corporate productivity, it's about business productivity, and it's about business returns. How can I show that these technologies are actually helping me generate more revenue, more gross margin dollars, more units and all the other things? And then last but not least is remote support. And when I say remote support, everything ranging from, yes, the help desk has now moved to the comforts of their dens, their offices, and in some cases, kitchen tables, 
but even simple things. Look, if you got to change out a spare part, maybe instead of sending someone there, we're now getting to the point of where we have items come back to the depot. And then instead of rolling out a tech or a truck, we actually have the depot send out instructions and people are doing self-install. So that's just a feel for some of the representative items that are best practices that we're hearing and seeing. And so you can imagine with all of this going on, there's a group of things that will become part of the new normal. And there are some things that will become less and less. So we tend to treat them as both accelerators and decelerators. And so what are some of those items that have changed forever? Real simple. And this is a, a representative list. Work from home is here to stay. I don't mean that just from individual perspective. I mean at executive board and uh, high level conversations where folks are starting to say, you know what? We didn't think this was really possible. Maybe we're going to start reconsidering both from a speed and a cost perspective. Hybrid multi-cloud, clearly there. If you're in the collaboration space, excellent. Smarter cities, which is something that you know, several of us are passionate about. It's not just about how do we get better communication, but how do we use much better telemetry? How do we use randomized, double underline, randomized data to talk about how things are spreading, how folks are basically maintaining quarantine, how information is getting out to the public. Remote learning, as we said before, clearly, and with most of us who have um, you know, children that are either still in, in high school or in college, that is becoming the way of life. In talking to a uh, large university, they're now contemplating that in some cases, this may be the way that they go forward. Telemedicine, clearly, um, near and dear to several of us, high performance computing, the ability to use that computational firepower, and in some cases, not only use that to help reduce these effects, but also help accelerate quantum computing. Delivery services, services, and then automated cybersecurity. Now, outside of technology, hey, some fun facts. Look, we're, we're practicing what we call virtual water coolers. To pick on my own organization, um, you know, two or three times a week, we pick right around noon time. It's the virtual water cooler. My boss and I and some of our peers, we have virtual happy hours. I'm sure poor Jay would prefer for it to be in real life because he's actually my, uh, my whiskey Sherpa. But the net is, is that other folks are able to do that. And if you think about the things that are becoming less and less, airlines, cruise ships, hospitality, this whole idea about open office concepts. We've had several customers hit us up and say, you know what, maybe an office or a pod is a really good idea. Malls, in-person markets, beauty services, those are items that we need to seriously look at. Is there a fundamental change required? And again, from a social perspective, hey, look, you know, this is a great forum. This is a wonderful event. But we need to really rethink through face-to-face -face networking and in some cases, socials and uh, as I alluded to, happy hours. So with that, I just wanted to give you a feel for what we're seeing in the global industry, what are some of the best practices at a high level, and then some things that are gonna both accelerate and decelerate. So with that, what I'd like to do now is turn it over into Amber, who's gonna tell you a little bit about uh, you know, her perspective and a little bit about the Austin Technology Council. Amber? Thank you, Jim. Um, trying to keep my dog from barking and, and everything else. So um, I'm Amber Gunn, I'm the CEO of Austin Technology Council. And I think like every other event, we wish we could see you in person. So we do appreciate you coming on board here. I'm gonna to talk to you about um, the efficient use of technology. So and it, over the last several weeks, I have done nothing but speak to our members about what they're doing, how they're doing it, what are some of the problems that they're facing and what are some of the solutions they're creating around it. The first thing I wanna bring up since we're on a Zoom call is that a lot of people are using video technology right now to connect with their clients, connect with their peers, connect with their bosses, their boards and, and their family and friends. Make sure you've got a couple of different options. Um, don't just rely on one because while all of these programs are working at optimal speed right now and all of these companies are doing a fantastic job keeping everything up and going, you don't wanna lose the opportunity, especially right now, of possibly losing or dropping a call with an important client that could possibly bring revenue in for your company. You don't wanna have a call dropped or have it frozen without the ability to go onto another platform if you are talking to your board specifically around anything in regards to your runway or, or what you might need assistance with. So just be conscientious that there are several products out there and so having a couple of them in your wheelhouse to be able to turn around to to say, 
hey, for some reason, Zoom's not working today, so we're going to use Starly, or we're going to use WebEx, or we're going to use any of these other options. A lot of these companies right now are providing discounted services or even free services for the next 60 to 90 days to companies who are in need of this. So review what you have out there, take a look at whether or not it either fits into your budget or there's an option that works for you, um, especially if you've got a lot of employees who are working from home and you need a lot of different options. Another thing that you wanna make sure that you're doing is, and I, I heard this from one of our board members today, is make sure that your employees are effectively using the tools that you have for communication. So a lot of companies are using Slack. A lot of companies are using you know, various items out there, whether it's your CRM, whether it is your marketing tools or anything else, make sure they're using them in the same standard way. Um, I know coming from a sales background, and, and picking up where somebody else is left off in a sale, a lot of times it can be very frustrating to try to figure out where that last conversation left off from and, and where you have that. And now that you've got so many people working from home and, and relying even more on these technologies, I think using it in a, in a way that everything is transparent and, and not completely standardized, but at least understandable to the people who are utilizing these tools, is really important. So we want to make sure that that we're working together as companies to say, hey, here's how I want this information to look, or here's how I'm going to interpret it. And, and also being understanding and realizing that as you're using these different tools for communication, that tone can get completely lost when you're sending this out, whether you're using Slack or email or chat or Hangouts or whatever it is you're using for your company to have a little bit of patience and a little bit of understanding for people that maybe that tone is not coming across or maybe the person in their way of their responding to that, that message or that email or that Slack that they possibly read it the wrong way and just be a little bit patient, a little bit understanding with people right now. That's a very key fundamental aspect. A lot of people are dealing with stress and they're dealing with anxiety in their homes. And so you want to make sure that you do have a little bit of understanding so that you don't break down that, that really important culture that your company has worked really hard and you've worked really hard to build up. The other aspect is you've got to have some forms of private communication between coworkers, peers, um, you know, employees to their leaders so that if somebody is struggling, if somebody is having an issue, whether they're dealing with anxiety and depression around everything that's going on right now, or they're dealing with frustrations that typically they can figure out a way to communicate in person with someone, but now that they can't communicate in person, they need a little bit more assistance with that. So I think giving those private lines of communication, whether it's you know, kind of like Jim said, they're, they're jumping on calls, they're, they're in communication with each other, being open to that and, and making sure that if you've got a team underneath you, that you're setting up one-on-one -on -one time with people, even if it's just a five to 10 minute check-in, making sure that you're checking in with people and that they're understanding that, that they're still part of this team. Um, one of the biggest areas that our members are concerned about right now, and I'm sure every company is concerned about, is that that critical investment of time and resources and energy that goes into building a positive company culture and this disbursement of employees all working individually from their homes can be really problematic for keeping that culture going so finding different ways to help build that up but also giving employees the ability to to have that private communication where they don't feel like it's constantly out in the public and everybody's going to see everything that goes out out there I think the final thing that I want to touch on is, is giving your employees the ability to get their work done. And instead of saying, you need to work from this hour to this hour. Right now, we're in unprecedented times. You have people who are home with their spouses and partners. They're home with their children. Their children need to do schooling. They're, they're in all of their areas that we have. Um, you know, that, that, you know, maybe the, the internet system or the infrastructure that they have out there wasn't built as robust as in other areas. And so I think giving people the ability to be able to work from, 
from the pace and the space that they need to get their job done. I want to give you an example from a personal aspect. Our director of marketing is one of the hardest working people I know. She's amazing. She does a great job every single day for us. And she's got two kids at home. Her husband's an essential worker. And so anytime her two young boys of, of nearly 11 and nine have a question, it's mom, I have a question, mom, I have a question, on top of the fact that homeschooling started this week with online learning. So what I did as her leader was say, come up with a schedule that is gonna work for you and your kids. I trust that you are going to get this job done. And the amount of pressure and anxiety that that left off from her, feeling this obligation to work from eight to five every single day was enormous. And she got the opportunity to do this. And in talking to a lot of our members, they're having equal conversations with their, their employees saying, I know that there's a time that your internet freezes up at home. I, I understand that your kids have to get this learning done and they're gonna have extra questions. I understand that you and your spouse live in a one bedroom apartment and sometimes you hear each other talk, so you want to take breaks in between. Give your employees that flexibility. They're dealing with as much stress and anxiety as you are right now. And we want to be able to make sure that you're giving them the opportunity to get their work done, whether that work starts at six in the morning and takes a break from nine until 11, or that work doesn't get started till 11 o'clock in the morning and they work until seven or nine o'clock at night. Make sure they're getting it done. And I feel like I've probably used up close to my amount of time. And so I'm going to pass this over to Julie Shell because I want to give a little extra time to UT Austin because after talking to Julie yesterday and hearing about the amazing things that they have done at, the, at her art school at UT, um, I want to give this time over to her and have her have the opportunity to share with you the amazing stuff that they were far ahead on. Go away, Julie. Thank you so much, Amber. I'm excited to be chatting with you. Uh, as as uh, Amber said, I'm the I'm Julie Shell, and I'm the Assistant Dean for Instructional Continuity and Innovation in the College of Fine Arts at the University of Texas at Austin. And what I wanted to start off uh, sharing with everyone today is that the major uh, the major um, activity that UT has engaged in that has helped it be successful in this time period is something we would call from the design world reframing. Uh, so to, in order to, to use effective technology or to use technology for effective learning at UT Austin, the number one uh, activity that, uh, that the university has engaged in is reframing. And what we have done is that we've reframed uh, COVID as a crisis and a problem and turned it into an opportunity. And thank you, Jay. Um, so, so instead of thinking uh, about, uh, you know, viewing viewing this as a as a as a crisis and a problem, UT very rapidly turned this into a design challenge, and it is a pretty wicked design challenge. Uh, how do you, within 14 days, um, design access to not just learning continuity but UT quality learning? Uh, to 49,058 remote students. Um, and uh, that, that was the challenge that was posed to our uh, approximately, um, uh, you know, uh, 5,000 faculty members. Um, so this is, this is something that we've, we've done here at UT. And uh, if you're taking, if you're thinking about how can I be successful um, in this time period, regardless of your, uh, re regardless of your organizational type, thinking about how to turn these problems into opportunities um, would be a great first step. And I wanna share a little bit now, and, and Jay can advance me to the next slide some of the questions that we asked. So um, as, as, a, uh, as a design challenge, uh, we posed several how might we's. Um, the first how might we is, how can we ensure that all of these 50,000 students have access to learning continuity? So at, at the university, we are considered, an, uh, learning is considered an essential activity like going to the doctor, uh, like, uh, like um, uh, going to the store. So we had to, instruct, instructors are considered in, uh, essential staff. So we had to very quickly figure out how we were gonna continue 
um, making sure that students had access to their learning. We were not going to just cancel uh, their education for the rest of the semester. So the first question that we that we had to to uh, to ponder was how do we provide access? And immediately our leadership decided we are going to go 100% online, um, and that was uh, the the response to that. And then the different um, uh, ideas for how we were going to do that flowed from that. The next question that we asked if, uh, was, okay, now that we know that we're going to go 100% online, how are we going to sure that there isn't, that the digital divide doesn't disrupt uh, students' um, learning continuity? So how do we ensure that no matter where they are, no matter who they are, no matter where they live, that students will have uh, technology uh, that they will have housing. So we have many students who, uh, when the university closed, they were living in the dorms. Uh, so there had to be um, um, exceptions to, to the rule that the university was closed and other emergency re resources to afford learning continuity. So that was a big question that the university asked. And what they did is pivot very quickly to create emergency resources for students who needed access to internet, who needed access to hardware, and who needed access to software. So um, um, this was a very fast pivot with very intense direct resources from leadership um, for emergency res uh, resources for students. Um, the next uh, uh, reframing that we asked is, okay, so we know we are going to put 100% of the courses online. We know that we're gonna make sure that we have the resources to bridge the digital divide. Now, how do we make sure that faculty and student um, content and experience is secure um, in a 100% virtual learning environment? Um, so this is one of the areas where uh, Zoom, um, native, native in Zoom, that's the technology that we're using to deliver all of our courses. Native in Zoom, uh, there was not, uh, um, um, act, there, there, the, the native Zoom, um, settings did not provide the kind of security that was needed. And so uh, the university made administrative decisions to create security measures uh, on it from a technology standpoint to ensure that students and faculty um, were, were, um, um, were protected um, and that they could share in a safe classroom environment um, um, the, the classroom experience. Julie, am I on the right slide for you right here? Am yeah, I... this is good. I'm going to navigate to this one right here. So, so okay. So now the task is how do we ensure that our faculty are trained up to rapidly pivot to remote instruction um, to ensure quality learning experiences? So we, we thought about affordability. We thought about accessibility. We thought about technology and security. And now we need to think about training all of these faculty to who are teaching face-to-face -face classes to pivot um, to remote instruction. Um, and you can go ahead and advance uh, to the next slide. Um, so with this design challenge and these four big questions, um, in the first day, day one at UT Austin, there were 5.2 million Zoom minutes by 3 p.m. that were uh, delivered. 150,000 participants and students all over the world um, engaging in uh, their learning experiences with their faculty. And you can ad advance to the next slide. I wanted to just to talk a second about um, some things that we did in the College of Fine Arts. Uh, it's particular um, challenge to teach students who, uh, for example, we have students who are organ students. We have theater students that uh, their, their craft is on the stage. We have design students, artists, painters. It's very hard to imagine how to translate that to an online experience. So this was quite the challenge and you can go ahead and advance to the next slide, but we took it on. The very first thing that we did is we created checklists. So we realized that faculty were going to need to have a very simple um, and easy way to uh, get up to speed on the technology. And then we realized very quickly that there were going to need some pedagogical support or some support about how people learn effectively online. So the very first thing we did is um, uh, we use the, I'm a big checklist manifesto fan and I created a, a very simple checklist um, for our faculty um, and, and distributed that. And then 
annotated that and I'm going to share that in the chat here in just a moment. Um, so one of the, the quickest things you can do is create checklists to help navigate people um, and help them um, get up to speed really quickly. And that's what we did for our training, both in terms of Zoom as well as pedagogy. And you can go ahead and navigate to the next one and we will share that checklist out. Um, we also implemented an acuity based staffing model. So like hospitals do where they send uh, the, the staff to the sickest patients, um, we, uh, we staffed up uh, to deal with training for our faculty and we held synchronous pedagogy focused training sessions. We served 500 participants in the span of a week. We started holding one on one office hours and we did uh, technology and pedagogy demonstrations. And this is one thing that we did. We made sure that we didn't just run technology training. We made sure that the technology training was um, was talked about how to help people learn. And that's what I mean by pedagogy. It wasn't just about the technology. And now we're doing asynchronous troubleshooting. Go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, we also picked one um, big pedagogical model uh, that is the most established model in um, in learning uh, in online learning, which is called community of inquiry and we shared that with all of our faculty and just closing up here. I wanted to share with you. Um, uh, how our faculty created a social presence for students, which means that the students feel real cognitive presence and that they engage in rigorous learning. And finally, a teaching presence where the instructor is um, creating a very um, thoughtful um, and organized flow for the classroom experience in a, in a virtual environment. Um, so if you want to navigate to the next slide. So first, I wanted to share about uh, our industrial di design professor, Verena Papke Hiltonis, and she thought about how can I make sure my students are able she's an industrial designer they did not have access to the lab to build materials um, and so one of the things that she did was um, she um, engaged students in a um, it, there's a special name for it adaptive reuse of materials in their home to create a product um, so instead they were going to make a product in the lab and instead what she did is have them identify common objects in homes and then study the materiality of those like egg cartons and mason jars um, and then pick a designer um, who made something in their home that they that they admire um, and come up with the, the sort of handwriting of that designer. And now the students are creating products based on the handwriting of that designer, as well as the found materials in their homes for their final projects. Um, so I thought that was a really um, um, interesting reframe and way to engage students in, uh, in cognitive presence and industrial design. And then finally, um, my last example, if you want to navigate to the next slide, um, uh, Professor Tammy Glass. Uh, teaches uh, futures design class. So that's pretty amazing because in before COVID, they were talking about what if the university went 100% online. Um, now that COVID, her futures design class is actually engaging in the preposterous future that they had developed. And one of the ways that she created social presence for her students, which again is making sure students feel real, uh, is that she actually created um, uh, futures design um, murals using the software mural um, and uh, which is a design software that anybody can use um, to allow her students to actually create um, pinups of their projects in a virtual space. So with that, I'll come to closure here when a minute over, um, but my, what I wanted to, to close up here is that UT Austin faculty continue uh, to actively design creative uh, design and create learning experiences of the first class for our students and they continue to live by the the motto what starts here changes the world um, and I, with that I'd like uh, very excited to introduce Jay who is going to to take us home here thank you thanks Julie well I get the hardest act to uh, to follow uh, not that uh, the previous ones weren't, but just the scale of that and the fact that it affects probably every single person on this call knows somebody that's associated with the learning that's going on at UT or frankly got learning <laughs> from the folks at UT and is going to receive it differently in the future. And the fact that they did that in, you know, such a short period of time is amazing. 
So I'm actually going to not have any slides and you're not gonna look at my face the whole time, although you can if you want. Uh, I'm actually gonna move online and do the rest of this in the way we're gonna be doing things for the rest of our lives. PowerPoint's dead, all those slide things are dead, all that stuff's dead. We'll just keep using it for a little while because we're dinosaurs. Instead, we're actually gonna use that thing called the web that we've been trying to use for a long time to make it interactive and live for the things that we do. Um, so let's talk about another group and company and entire sport that had to figure out what the heck to do. Hey, guess what, guys? We're not going to have football. We're not going to have basketball. We're not going to have soccer. But more importantly, we're not going to have F1. What? We didn't we just build a track? What we, we have all this stuff. I mean, now we're not, we can't use it. We're not going to do it. What are we going to do? What are the drivers going to do? What are the car companies going to do? What are the sponsors going to do? What, I mean, just imagine the shock to the overall global system. I mean, this is a global sport that spends billions of dollars and drives all kinds of things. So imagine the poor guy who came in and said, hey, you know that one thing we did last year where we had the drivers play on those little uh, game consoles? We're gonna take the entire F1 circuit and do actually every race that we actually did, except we're gonna do it virtually in the game track and all the drivers are gonna get trained to drive on the game track. No way, nobody would let anybody do that. Well, guess what? Here's the Bahrain Virtual Grand Prix 2020, right here, live. I just wanted you to get the picture that these are actual drivers. You can go to Twitch. By the way, I'm going to show you a lot of different uh, platforms. I can't possibly go through all the stuff that's going on in the world out there. But Twitch TV is not just a bunch of game people in there now. It's esports. It's virtual sports. There's basketball. There's football. There's all kinds of things. So if you've got a sport, I guarantee you that there's some form of esport that's going on on Twitch TV. Twitch.tv is the URL and you can actually go there and check it out. And there'll be huge communities of people. I don't know if you noticed, but there are 34,371 people watching this event online when it went live on, I think the 22nd, 16 days ago, whenever it was recently. Um, there are even more now. You can go to these events, there'll be 50, 100,000, 200,000 people, you know, watching these events, more than could ever actually have been there in person or even many times watch them on television, uh, particularly if you're on the Golf Channel. No, I'm just kidding. But, but you can actually go to virtual golf and, and see all those things too. So I'm gonna go really fast through a bunch of different things, but I wanted you to just stop and think about what it took to move F1 to online, just like moving UT to online. So I'm gonna get a little closer to home and talk about what do you do with your family? And I'm gonna talk about what I do with my family. So we, we like to play tabletop games and there are a lot of different tabletop games, but obviously it's very hard if you're spread apart, if your family's in different places, if your friends are in different places, if you like to play chess, if you like to play, you know, almost any kind of card game or anything else, how the heck do you do that when you can't, you know, bring yourselves together? Well, there are all kinds of solutions. One of those is something called Tabletop Simulator. You can get this from a lot of different places. It's tabletopsimulator.com and you can see how to do it. But any game that you can play on a tabletop, you can bet that there's actually a tabletop simulator plugin for that game to be played, whether it's a card game, tabletop game, Warhammer 40K, Fantasy Battles, uh, you know, you name it. Uh, there's actually a tabletop simulator, Dominoes. I mean, I, I'm always amazed. Go, I play Go. If you want to play Go, just drop me a line. Uh, we can play some Go. So, so there are a lot of great things that you can do now that you could do before, but you might not have known that these resources are available. Uh, literally the other day on Tabletop Simulator, when I went on, there were over 6 million people playing different games on Tabletop Simulator, 6 million. Now true, there were 40 million playing Grand Theft Auto, but you know, that's, a different, that's a different kind of game. Um, so how do you talk? when you're doing these things. There were a lot of questions in chat and we'll address some of them in the Q&A about how do you actually make this an experience? How do you carry what we do in the real world over into these kind of things? I mean, some kind of virtual game's great, but you know, we all know that when you're playing poker, it's the banner that's the most important thing. It's the, 
you know, it's the, I'm refraining from doing any Monty Python jokes, by the way, around banter when I said that. But, uh, but you know, how do, we, how do we actually communicate with each other? How do we share what we're feeling in those things rather than just moving checkers around the board or moving chess pieces around the board? Well, there's a great tool called Discord. Uh, Discord is, a, is similar to what we're using right now in Zoom, except Discord's designed specifically for social interaction. It's designed for communities. It's designed for friends. It's designed to directly integrate with different kinds of games. So it prides itself on having an integration system that will allow you to plug into whatever game, game device, or anything else you have. So what if, you know, like me, my kids are way better at some games than I am, but I still like to interact with them. Well, it has a private broadcast channel. So, for example, if, uh, you know, my daughter happens to be playing World of Warcraft and, you know, I can't play with her and I want to watch what's going on with her and her guild as they go take down some large scale objective, she can actually stream it directly on her private family channel and all of us can watch and cheer her on. So there's a lot of ways to interact today that the companies have been working on for years in the gaming industry and other places that people have been thinking about how does all this work um, that can now actually help us bring ourselves and the things that we do into this this whole kind of brave new world that we're in. So just a couple of other ones I'm going to put up here for those of you that don't maybe don't know, hey, what tabletop game should I play with people? How can we be entertained? What's good for the family? What's good with, you know, being my friends? Uh, Catan is a great game. It's a simple trading game that can be very complex. It's very uh, entertaining. It runs on every single device, as you can see down there. It runs on browsers, it runs on phones and devices, everything. So uh, it's also uh, free to get the app and free to buy the basic version, so you can add some things to it. I always try to show people some of the free options around here because, you know, hey, you might want to try this out uh, and you don't want to invest a lot of money and time, you know, to see how, how you can play these things. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about. Um, is something that's simply there to make you happy. Some games are challenging, some games are there to be competitive, but some games are just plain cute. Now, you, you may laugh and you say, okay, Jay, this is a cute game, I got it. There's no chance I can play this. Let me tell you, Vin Diesel plays this game, all right? So, so, so this game is actually uh, an a effervescent experience. So you might not be able to go out and hike mountains. You might not be able to go out and, you know, see your favorite view of the shore or anything else. This game recreates it by putting you with a bunch of animals on an island. By the way, it's full multiplayer too. If you want to turn on the multiplayer piece, there are literally millions of people playing this all the time. They'll be willing to come help you build your little house on your little island and everything else to do. So if you need to get the heck away from COVID-19 and you need to stop reading the news and you need to stop doing all those things, it's a great way to, uh, to, to get out uh, and, uh, and check it out. All right, let's get to the real thing everybody wants to know. How do I have a successful virtual happy hour? What do I have to do to be able to drink with friends or family or anybody? Um, this is a great article from uh, the New York Times. It'll be linked in uh, our stuff afterwards. Um, but I think uh, it's really clear that you only need a couple of things and most of you already have it. Number one, you need a way to communicate via video you guys are ready. I'm going to talk a little bit about how you get all your friends on with you in a second. And two, you need whatever alcohol you've got. Uh, of course, you know, the most famous uh, drink that's come out of the coronavirus epic, uh, epidemic so far is the, you know, uh, quarantini. Now, most of you may know, I'll give you the short version of how to make a quarantini. Um, get whatever you have, pour some of it together and drink it. That's it. It's very simple. The quarantini has no complex recipe uh, and it can be different from everybody else. Uh, now, there are some famous celebrities uh, and chefs that have created their own forms of quarantini. I'll let you guys find those to yourself as you Google quarantini. How do you do it? Well, we're doing it right now. We're using Zoom's webinar uh, function, but Zoom's uh, actual video conferencing function is free for 40 minutes. Got to drink fast. Um, or it's inexpensive uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to uh, sign up for it uh, or, or get folks, uh, you know, their own copies. Many of your companies, you can do that. Oh, oh Amber, did I say that? I didn't say that, Amber, I swear. Uh, but, you know, if your company has one, hey, feel free to use it for this. They won't notice. You've already on Zoom so much, it won't matter. Um, but uh, I want to say a couple things about Zoom security. There's been a lot of talk, you know, Zoom's insecure. Oh, my gosh, we're going to trash it. We shouldn't use it, et cetera. Look, no one. Absolutely no one, and Jim can attest to this too, Jay can attest to this, everybody on this call that's up here can attest to this. No one was prepared for the level of infrastructure stress 
that every kind of system has been placed upon it. Just to give you an example, Microsoft Azure, their infrastructure services grew 775% in 14 days. Um, no one could have predicted that. Nobody's model, nobody's projections, anything could have predicted that. So uh, Zoom was put in a tough position. You know, they, 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 everybody has weaknesses in their infrastructure. I will say that as companies go within 48 hours of those being identified, they came out, they admitted there were problems, they identified what those were, they stopped development of any new features and immediately turned their entire development team to fixing those holes. I've had four patches in the last 30 hours uh, from Zoom uh, in doing things. Very few companies uh, you know, are capable of responding uh, at that level. You know, so for personal use, for anything you know less than your Department of Defense connections uh, and a few other things, I mean, you should then have virtual private networks and other kinds of things to protect yourself. I got one minute, I see. I'm in a hurry. Um, so, you know, Zoom's fine, use it. A couple of quick other things here. Uh, I've got a couple of links to uh, all the live streaming virtual conferences, concerts you wanna watch. And I've got a link to all the Austin events that you wanna use and watch. Um, but for the last second here, I just wanna show you something that's unbelievable. If you haven't seen this, just to give you an idea of what you can do if you happen to be these two people uh, with your friends and everything on, I'm gonna leave you with a girl who said, I'm really bummed because I'm stuck at home because of the coronavirus and I'm not gonna to get to go see Hamilton. So these two people who everybody knows basically said, we're gonna do something about that. And so, can you guys hear that at all? Turn it up a little bit. Oh, wow. Oh, Miranda? Oh, wait. Hey, Glenn, I didn't know you could Zoom bomb, man. That's a yeah, little Liz, weird. This is a Zoom bomb. She's here to see Mary Poppins, not Jack the Lamplighter. Yeah, okay? exactly. Hi, Aubrey. How are you? Uh, I'm Good. so you didn't get to see Hamilton. I'm so glad to meet you. <laughs> oh my God. Hi. Oh um, man, Lynn, thank you so much for stopping by, but uh, we, we pretty much got it handled now. We, just, Liz, we did a really classy thing. We sent her tickets. Oh, are you a big office her... man? Nope. You don't really see it. I'm a big fan of the names of it though. Oh, bless. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up, Lynn. That was a sort of... <laughs> <laughs> I gotta burn up one more minute, Jay. Lynn, and we're gonna send her to Hamilton in New York. Well, that's amazing. Um, I I think we can top that right now. Though. Oh wait, something. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Right. Much people just joining. That's my favorite song from Hamilton. There's a bastard, orphan, son of a whore and a Scotsman Dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean By providence and operation Forgive me for fast forwarding And the world's gonna know your name It's your name, Alexander Hamilton My name is Alexander Hamilton Alexander's mother buried him half dead, sitting in their own sick, the sick thick. And Alice got better when his mother went quick. But could you see him now? Was he from the mouth of the ship? Had to put a new name in New York. You can't be a new man. All right, all right. So I know Jay's getting nervous, but for everybody, go watch it because you know that's the example of the great things. On by the way, some good news that you can go check out, which uh, comes out intermittently. But uh, I want to leave everybody on a good note. Jay, back to you. All right, thank you, Jay, and thank you to all the panelists. So, as is probably to be expected for our first Zoom-based event, we have run just a little bit over but we are still well under the schedule for our normal in-person events. I do want to still have some Q&A here today. So we're very fortunate that Adnan Khalil, also from Dell Technologies, is going to pick a handful of questions. We hope you can stay with us. We see a lot of people tuned in today's event. Uh, give us a little more time. We'll answer three or four questions and then Adnan will pick the winning question for the South by Southwest badge. And to win that badge, you must still be online when we get to that question. So take it away, Adnan. 
All right. Well, thank you very much, Jay. Okay. So, uh, lots of great questions, as you could have seen from the question Q and A box. We had uh, people that were typing in, you know, very relevant questions. All right. So, for my first question, um, it's a question from David Root, and he wanted to know how can non-native English speakers, English as a second language, be fairly treated and effective in these new environments? These new communication methods can cause further problems for those folks. So, well, can, Jay, are we going to have one of the panelists? I can actually tackle okay. that a little right. bit, or whoever wants to. Okay, well, so one thing that is great uh, about this is there are lots of uh, online translation programs that can run alongside um, the kind of things that are doing here. There are also subtitling uh, that does things uh, via video, both in semi-real time and near real time. So there are plugins that can actually help uh, do a lot of those different things. They vary in terms of quality. They vary in terms of their ability to do things. Um, folks like Google are working on that as a, as a native plugin. So is Apple. Both of them have uh, toolkits that uh, are being used with this. A lot of virtual reality kinds of things that are going on now are all multilingual. Um, when they're deployed, so you can choose your language uh, as, as you're doing them. So I think this is giving everybody an opportunity to, to start to be able to do those kind of things. One of the things all those need is literally millions and millions and millions of hours of audio and video to get video nuance and face nuance and everything else. And many different people are being able to opt in to provide that video. If you go on your Apple device, it'll ask you, Siri will say, can I have access to your audio recordings? Can I have access to your video recordings? Many people worry about that from a privacy standpoint, but what's actually happening with that is it's actually being used to be able to refine all of those kinds of artificial intelligence-based systems. Okay, well, thank you, Joe. All right, so for the next question, Matt Nelson uh, asks, how can teachers provide children, students with multi-sensory experiences when the delivery mechanism is entirely remote? So, Julie, would you like Julie's, to take that? That's Julie's. Sure. Um, I'll, I'm happy to, to jump on that one. Um, so, I think that uh, our, our um, example of our industrial design um, faculty member uh, was a really good one in response to that. So, providing multisensory experiences for students, um, finding ways for them to engage by using materials that they might find in their homes um, to, to engage in um, project based work. Um, I also think that luckily um, there, there are a lot of um, multisensory experiences that students can engage in through the internet, um, including audio, um, video, and tactile experiences with found objects. Um, one of my favorite examples uh, from this week was uh, another faculty member who had um, students uh, as part of their project um, take photographs of um, objects in their homes um, and then discuss those discuss those photographs particular to the to the course. So I think being creative and, and reframing that question um, as at using that reframing principle of it's not um, we can't provide multisensory experiences, but how might we use common everyday objects to provide multisensory experiences for students um, can really open up the the brainstorming on that. Okay, thank you very much, Julie. Well, this next question from Heather Pogimanis has Jim Gante written all over it. So Jim, if you're ready, how do you keep your company culture as a differentiator in a tight tech market? Wow, um, so there's multiple ways to go do that. First of all, the way that we keep our culture together today is something that we call culture code. Culture code was actually written by the majority of the uh, Dell employees. And it talks about the things that we not only hold as high values, but the management aspects and also the individual aspects to do that. The other piece is, you know, in today's world or in the new normal, there's a whole bunch of things that have been occurring. But I think probably the, the best advice I could give everybody is one constant, early, often communication with your teams, with your leadership, and in some cases across the companies, uh, you know, Probably the first week that we were ordered to uh, stay at home, 
there was a conversation with the senior leadership team, which was asked to be cascaded to pretty much every employee. So making sure that you maintain that, that, um, that personal touch, making sure that the things that we hold dear, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, you know, I got in a couple of emails today that talked about how multiple members of our team around the world were helping everybody from educational customers all the way up to and including some of our government customers. If you want to talk about interesting, try dealing with a group of individuals who traditionally have to be in the office because of the computational firepower they have. And by the way, you're not allowed to leave the facilities with any of the things that they tend to work on. So um, having a good cultural base while we were still, quote unquote, being in the office and really making that part of not just what we do every day, but frankly, who we are, actually making it part of your success metrics. And then even if we're not physically together, ensuring that through communication, constant touch, and in some cases, just you know, real world examples and sharing and being there for each other, that's how you maintain not just the culture, but honestly, you maintain the ethos of the company and not only what we do, but who we are. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim. Okay, so, um, God, there's so many good questions. I'm having a tough time. Jay, how much time do we have left? And then before you move on from that one, I'd like to hear if Amber wants to add anything on that one too, because she represents companies that have over half the tech employees in town. And so she's probably heard some interesting things on that last question as well. Yeah, I think the most important thing, again, like, like Jim brought up, is that communication aspect. And in having many lines and many forms of communication, there are going to be some things that work for some people and some things that don't, especially when you're talking about your leadership team. A, a lot of us executives, we're having to make really difficult decisions right now. And, and there's, there are some people out there that like to do the, hey, gotcha moment. Um, specifically in the press and, and on popular blogs and everything else, there are going to be some things that your leadership team can be completely transparent with you about. There are going to be other things that they can't from a legal aspect. And so I think maintaining that open dialogue and maintaining that open communication and also being patient with them and being understanding that they're trying to figure this out and, and not to be detrimental to you as a personal individual, but to try to salvage and save the company and to possibly even be able to bring you back at some point if they do have to go to a furlough or a layoff. So I think just being understanding that this is something no, I mean, we should have seen coming back in January when this hit widespread in Wuhan and we had the first case here in the US, woulda, shoulda, coulda on that one. But the reality is everybody's trying to adapt. Everybody is trying to deal with it right now. So instead of looking at company leadership or your individual boss within the company and trying to find gotcha moments on that person, be open, be understanding. This sucks for everyone. There is no one that I've talked to that has said, this has been really good for me and my company. Um, every single senior level executive and every single CEO that I've talked to since March, their number one concern is their employees and, and being able to keep their employees and being able to keep the company healthy for those employees. So open lines of communication are important, but also understanding when your senior leadership cannot have open lines of communication for you. They're usually in that mode of they're trying to do something in your best interest but if they start talking about it, it could possibly derail it. So just understanding and patience right now is the key thing to do. So related to that, Amber, uh, there's a question from Bruce McGraw, and he would like to know, what are the top actions processes that a manager needs to do in order to manage remote virtual workers? They're learning that every Ready? day. <laughs> um, I, I, I think the number one thing is, is reaching out to employees individually to figure out what tools and what resources are working for them and what are not. Um, also figuring out what communication styles are working for employees and, and what communication styles are not working. Um, having really transparent and direct conversations about that. Um, a lot of people are sending me Slack. To me, Slack is just like ADD on crack. And it, it drives me a little bit insane. I, I will go on there, but it's, it's like, it, it just doesn't work for me. So when my team said, hey, we'd like to adopt Slack, I was like, no, that, like, that's gonna frustrate me and I'm gonna get annoyed. And so we found that Google Hangouts worked for us. And so being able to use Google Chat and Hangouts, that worked for us. 
um, you know, and, and, and letting them know like, hey, if you text me, I'm going to get back to you so much faster than if I'm going to use Slack, but also understanding that sometimes I'm on the phone or I'm responding to emails and I'm not looking at my phone to see text. So that's where we came to that that commonality on on how we were going to communicate with each other. And then I think keeping a steady aspect to it, like, like don't drop off. Don't, don't kind of disappear. If you know you're going to disappear for a couple of hours because you need to get something done, like let your employees know, like, like send out a, a message to everybody on the form that you're using saying, Hey, for the next two hours, I'm not going to be available because I've got this deadline to hit or my kid is struggling in this math issue and I need to help them with that. So I think keeping that communication open, letting people know, but also being consistent in how you're using that communication style is really what's key. All right, thank you. Uh, um, so, okay, the next question is from Amy Ashley and she would like to know, what about people who are in digital isolation, no access to technology, internet, data, et cetera? So many will be left behind. Will we ever catch up? So I can tackle this a little bit and then Jim's probably got a perspective on it uh, as well. Um, you know, one of the interesting things is that right now we've already separated ourselves from a lot of our loved ones. Many of us have, you know, older loved ones who, you know, if your family's like mine and uh, your older loved ones are still are using their iPhone six because they thought it was the greatest thing that they ever had or maybe their iPhone four or maybe their, maybe their flip phone even, believe it or not. I have somebody that has a, a flip phone that's still running. So it's quite challenging now because they can't see their grandchildren, they can't see their children, they can't see the family, we can't go to them. Um, you know, it's been quite the challenge uh, for us to do that. But, and, and they're in a rural area. Somebody was asking a question about rural broadband and things like that. There, there are a ton of issues around these things. I will say this though, it's unbelievable how much bandwidth you can actually get even through a 3G or 4G connection now on a good device just by drop shipping the device into wherever they are and having them turn it on after you've preset it up. So one of the things that I encourage every single person to do because isolation is affecting us all and it's gonna continue, it is not gonna be over tomorrow, but it's especially affecting our older generation that are either in nursing homes or care facilities where they have to be or worse, they're, they're isolated in their home by themselves. Um, you know, So anything that you can do to get them in communication, even if it's a voice call, uh, even if it's just chatting for 15 minutes a day, any of those kind of things, I encourage every single person to try and do and especially because I have this problem, getting them in contact with their grandchildren, getting your actual child to talk to their actual grandparent on a phone, you know, is not something they're used to doing. And so you have to structure that and, and add more structure and discipline into the situation to be able um, to do those kind of things. And so uh, I think we're all evolving from an infrastructure standpoint. I'll address one of the questions I saw go by in here was, did we have to put more in infrastructure in place to make all this happen to support this. You've probably seen they slowed down YouTube in Europe, they've slowed down Netflix, they've slowed those things down. I will say as a tribute to, to people that built the TCP IP and other protocols that underlie all of this, the companies like Dell who have continuously upgraded every piece of equipment that's ever existed, not to make more money necessarily, but to make technology better. And all of the other great companies out there who are constantly striving, this is what we get. This is where everybody's like, I have to upgrade my iPhone every year. God, I can't believe I got to spend $45 for my cable or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, what's the price of that? Right now it's priceless. It's priceless for us to have been able to continue to do these things. Yes, there are many people that their jobs don't allow for this, that they can't do it. But even because 40% of the population can still carry on with the things that's doing, because we can communicate, because we can make things happen like ventilators, like all the stuff using all of these kinds of things, you know, it's priceless. And so, so it's been, it's been unbelievable how far we've come, you know, to be able to do this 10 years ago, this would never have been able to happen. Yeah. I mean, uh, to add on to Jay's point, staying in touch takes on many forms. There's the everything, if you want to think about it continuum wise from just a phone call where you don't have to be as elegant or as modern as we're doing here, to uh, you know, some simple examples. I'll give you a, a real world case in point. I think one of my favorites is we wound up doing a lot of work with, I won't say who, but a particular uh, healthcare organization. And frankly, what wound up happening is they didn't have to learn anything new. We always had this assumption of people have to learn how to quote, utilize new technology. 
look, you know, we wound up taking a whole bunch of used um, tablets and or PCs, got them all set up and running. And all the person had to do was walk into this particular elder individual's room, put it in front of them. They saw the picture. They started having conversations. So um, let's take two optics. One is, hey, look, staying in touch can be everything from a simple phone call for the technology. And by the way, if it happens to be the technology, let's not force them to make anything that they have to learn that's new. Let's just make the technology transparent. So in essence, they get to use it without having to become tech experts like all of us. All right, before Adnan asks the final question, the question that will win the badge to South by Southwest 2021, I wanna ask Jessica really quickly just to share the special event that we've scheduled on Zoom for two weeks from tonight. So Jessica, can you remind everybody what we're gonna do that night? Jessica. Jessica, you're on mute. I'm <laughs> sorry, I was muted in two places, not just one. So no, <laughs> tech being similar. Um, two weeks from tonight, we will have a special additional Austin Forum event online, clearly, on tech for health and well-being during these crazy COVID times. So we are we are confirming a speaker with Baylor Scott and White, thanks to Amber Gunst, uh, who connected us about mental health, there'll be physical health and emotional health and how to maintain and even thrive in those areas with technology in spite of technology um, during these strange, strange times we're in. So I'm really excited about ne um, the next event. So stay tuned uh, and event bright and uh, information will be out for it shortly. We know everybody's gonna be sheltering at home. So we know where you'll be. Thanks, Jessica. So Adnan, take it away. Last question of the night for the badge winner. Let us know who won. Drum roll, please. Okay, all right. So the last question is, and the winner is Sanjana Pai. And she asks, do you see this transition to having activities work being fully online impact us negatively after the virus subsides? Since tech addiction is already an issue, do you think the situation would cause society to be even less social after the fact? So I'm, I'm going to jump in for just a quick second um, because like Austin Forum, Austin Technology Council puts on events and, and that's what we do. And our members network in person and, and that's their preference. There's not one single person that I've connected with over the last several weeks that doesn't miss seeing their coworkers on a regular basis, that doesn't miss getting out in front of people on a regular basis. Now, does that mean that the moment that the shelter in place and the quarantines are gonna end, that people are gonna rush out and, and go hang out and, and be in rooms of 500 people? Probably not. We're probably not gonna see that activity level until late September, early October. Um, from an ATC aspect, we're not putting on any in-person events um, through the end of June. And, and even the events that we will put on, if, if we do put on events, the physical in-person events in July, they're going to be really small, like, like maybe no more than 10 to 30 people involved in it. So, and, and putting together aspects of, listen, if you purchase this ticket and you can't make it the day of because you're not feeling well, we're going to let you use that ticket towards something else. And so we're going to have to make adjustments and we're going to have to, to get people, you know, in an understanding that we're all in this together and we're going to continue being all in this together until there's a vaccine available for this. But I think the hunger that people are going to have, even, even my most introverted friends um, are texting me and telling me how much they miss me and they want to see me in person. There's still that human connection of seeing people face to face in an action. This is great and this is wonderful and you all look lovely, but an actual face to face where they can communicate and they can share body language and, and all those things that we've just taken for granted for a very long time. So, so we'll come back, but I think what we're learning now is we don't have to do things the way that we did them before we can find more efficient and more effective ways to do things, especially to create longer term employment for employees and, and to give them a little bit more of that work life balance that everyone needs. But we're never going to get away from people wanting to, to physically be in the same space as each other. We're just going to have to take a little bit of time before 
we put 300 to 400 people in the same space as each other. Yeah, and then on, I'll add, and then uh, Jay can, can give his input too. I, I think what's gonna end up happening is what we thought was not normal now becomes more acceptable. Now, will it replace, you know, as Amber was saying, the human touch, the interaction, the, you know, being in a room with everybody else, probably not. But I think we will start to see a shift where if it was, let's put it on a scale of one to 100, 25 was where we were before. It may be closer to 40, 50 now, but it'll never really replace the, you know, sitting down at a table, having a conversation, sharing a glass um, with other folks. Well, I think, I think what's interesting is I've learned more about some people from being on these Zooms than I ever would have known before. So I would have never met Amber's dog, for example, right? I would know that Jim had such good taste in chairs. Uh, <laughs> I, I have My to, wife. I, I have drank everything on Jay's behind his bar, so that doesn't really count. But, you know, uh, Jessica's taste in guitars wouldn't have come out. Uh, and all of those, all of those kind of things are subtle kinds of things. But I actually have felt more connected to some people, particularly people that are distant from me, that are not in my town, that are not around me. I've, I've reached out in different caring ways to different people and gotten the same in return uh, with all of us working together to try and, you know, make things better when we're all in these isolated situations. And so, so while I don't wanna say, you know, this has led to, you know, a lot of good things, I think inadvertently, as many of crises do, this has led us to actually learn more things about each other, you know, to, to kind of let down our guard in some ways, particularly professionally. I mean, I think professionally, we all kind of carry our shield around with us a lot, especially if we're traveling and we're out and we're doing things. And, you know, Jim mentioned saving two hours each way. You know, some of that time that's getting saved is now meant saying, how are you? How are you doing? Are you okay in this kind of situation? And that opens up a new channel of communication with people that when you're rushed and you've been hurrying and you're just trying to get the job done every day and you got to do your thing, you don't have the opportunity to understand the other person as well. So I think there's a balance. I, I you know, obviously I want to get the heck out of here just like everybody else. I, I'm still, it makes me cry that Sixth Street's is boarded up. But, uh, you know, because, you know, I, I want to go do stuff. I can't go to the Alamo Theater to see a movie, you know, it's just a killer, right? And so, but I also think, you know, we're getting to relate in different kind of ways we didn't before with all of you. I got 166 people out there at the Austin Forum at 737. Y'all would have already been at Trifecta drinking if we were actually at the library. Uh, no, that's not true, Jay. I don't open the Trifecta chat tab till 815. We're early by drinking. <laughs> I was trying to give you an out, Jay, because everybody wants to go earlier. So, anyway. Jay, right. you. Julie, you want to close us out with your answer to this last question? Sure. I think a really important question is, what do we want to preserve and what do we want to leave behind? So for us at UT Austin, one of the things that we're witnessing right now is just an incredible surge of, of effort to, um, to uh, update teaching and provide exceptional learning opportunities using um, technologies and and digital um, uh, digi digital pedagogies, and so one of the things that we're that's first and foremost on our mind right now is what do we want to preserve um, in this in the, uh, from this moment and and carry forward uh, with us uh, once we're we're past this. And so I think um, that that's what I would recommend everybody ask is what do you want to preserve and and what is the uh, what is your planning and execution to make sure that you do that. Well, 